Oh, for sure. Mm. I'm on the try. At least. Okay. See a couple of people. Let's have a short See, that's why I knew that there was a little bit of a gap. Well, I'm going to have to get people to move in here. You can make it smaller. Yeah. Fabulous. Okay, welcome everybody. You want me to introduce you first? Are you okay? Should we get started? All right. All right, welcome everyone to CUA EECS Seminar Series called 2021. I want to speak about for today's seminar is Dr. Sergio Ficosi from the Catholic University of America. Uh, Dr. Ficosi is currently a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He received his bachelor's degree in physics uh, from with a master's degree. With a master's degree, yes. Yeah. In uh, physics uh, from University of uh, Napoli, Federico II, in, in Italy. He, was, he, he then went on and received his PhD in physics from Southern Illinois University. His research interests um, revolve around electromagnetic compatibility, mechanical properties of materials, additive manufacturing. For today's presentation, he will share with us his research on better materials, beyond materials, and beyond what was thought possible. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sergio Picosi, and we look forward to his wonderful presentation. And so uh, we are under time pressure. Therefore, I'll try to uh, go as fast as I can without undermining the clarity of the presentation. So metamaterials. So I think it's fair to say that most of what we do in engineering is all about two things, structures and devices. So with structures, essentially we want to control the way forces distribute themselves within the structure. Forces can be seen as momentum flows. So we want to control our momentum flows through structures. With devices, instead, uh, basically what we want to control, what we want to do is the control the transport of energy from place to place. And uh, we are interested actually today in controlling that transport of energy from place to place. Now, uh, nature has a couple of uh, strategies to transport energy. Energy can certainly be transported by moving masses in the form of kinetic energy, such as, for example, this picture throwing a baseball. Uh, if you don't believe me that uh, that's a good way of transporting energy, ask this guy who was hit by one of these fastballs. Um, now, however, the other uh, way that nature has to transport energy is by waves. So what is a wave? It can be defined in a million different ways. The best definition I know of is by Gerald Witten, a uh, great mathematical physicist of the 20th century, also a great one of the greatest experts on oceanic waves and transport waves. So essentially, you can read yourself, I don't read off my slides, but uh, essentially you can think of a wave as any field configuration to which somehow you can ascribe the velocity of propagation. For us, that's a wave. Anything, any field configuration to which you can attach the speed of propagation, velocity of propagation at all times, was is a wave. Now, waves are nature's way of transporting energy without transport of mass. So think of uh, a wave on a string, for example. Let me activate the pointer. So in a wave on a string, essentially the uh, points of the physical string uh, oscillate up and down, but the energy actually travels uh, uh, to, uh, you know, along the string itself. So whereas uh, energy travels, 
uh, mass really doesn't uh, it is not is not displaced, including ocean waves. So the uh, uh, molecules of water that hit the shore are not the same that were uh, caused by the waves, you know, two miles out. So basically, in a water wave, uh, the movement is a little more complicated and up and down, it goes pretty much in elliptical uh, trajectories. But again, there is a transport of energy. Look at this without transport of mass. These are waves. Now, and it's not just mechanical energy. Uh, so, this is, for example, a depiction of the legendary story of Archimedes, uh, who uh, noted uh, is known as the greatest uh, scientist of antiquity. Who uh, apparently was able to, uh, during the siege of Syracuse, where he uh, lived uh, on the part of the Roman fleet, he was able using these burning mirrors, come, you know, uh, basically uh, focusing electromagnetic waves, he was able uh, apparently to burn uh, some ships of the Roman fleet. So certainly electromagnetic waves can transport energy. Now, waves, all kinds of waves, in order to propagate, need a medium. So some of you probably will be saying, well, not really all waves, but I insist. So because, you know, probably uh, many of you know that electromagnetic waves can propagate in a vacuum without any medium. However, let's agree on the following definition of a medium. For our purposes, a medium is a region of space with the following two properties. Property number one, at each point, there's got to be a mechanism to store energy. Property number two, at each point, there's got to be a mechanism to transfer that energy to that point to neighboring points. Such a region of space for us will be a medium. So vacuum also water, vacuum occupied by the electromagnetic field also qualifies as a medium. Now, these are the uh, equations that describe the propagation of electromagnetic waves. Uh, and so, you know, how are the properties of this medium reflected in the equation? The only parameter that appears in the equation is this mysterious C, nothing else. So C turns out to be what is normally uh, referred to as the speed of light. And it turns out that this quantity, this parameter, actually depends on two material properties, uh, mu and epsilon. Mu is called the, is, is called the magnetic permeability, epsilon is called the electrical permittivity. Those two are material properties. They depend on a specific material. So those, pro those two properties and those alone, alone determine how electromagnetic waves travel in a medium. Now, what do they describe? Well, uh, there is a uh, basic model, an electric dipole, essentially two charges equal and opposite separated to, by a distance. That's an electric dipole. So what the permittivity epsilon describes is simply how such dipoles respond to an applied electric field. So even atoms that are perfectly uh, symmetrical, there's no uh, uh, unbalance in the distribution of charges, when exposed to an electric field, they can react in two ways. One, they can be stretched, and so, so the positive charge goes one way, the negative charge goes the other way, so a dipole is created even if it's not already there. And then the dipole aligns itself with the electric field to some extent. So the degree of alignment and how, uh, how powerful the alignment is. That? Yeah, sure, look. It's described by epsilon. So this is what epsilon describes. Uh, what about mu, the magnetic permeability? Well, just like there is this model of an electric dipole, there is also a model of a magnetic dipole. So you can think of a magnetic dipole as a microscopic uh, bar magnet with a north and south pole, but also the same effect can be produced by a tiny loop of current with the uh, direction of the axis being perpendicular to the plane of the loop. So uh, such models uh, can actually be uh, can actually simulate the effect of, for example, of electrons revolving around the nucleus. So uh, the uh, uh, direction perpendicular to the plane of the orbit essentially can be aligned in accordance to an applied magnetic field. So mu, the permeability, describes the uh, degree of alignment and the direction of the alignment. So this is what those two material properties describe. How materials respond to an applied electric field and magnetic field respectively. Now, if you're shopping, it's like, okay, so I would like to shop 
and get myself a materials for certain values of that tool. And what do I have in the store? So pretty much most materials uh, have epsilon mu both being positive. Uh, there are cases uh, in which epsilon can be negative, mu positive. Some cases in which mu can be negative, epsilon positive. And mind you, those two quantities depend on frequencies. So in no case, you can find epsilon mu simultaneously negative, meaning negative within the same range of frequencies. So if you're uh, looking for materials with both epsilon and mu negative, you're out of luck. There's no such thing. Why? Because uh, uh, there's simply nothing like that in nature. However, in 1967, uh, Victor Dezelego, Soviet scientist, uh, wrote a paper that at the time caught pretty much zero attention. And in that paper, he said, he speculated, granted, there's no such thing as materials with epsilon and mu both negative. But if there were, how would they behave? And so he wrote this paper, which is actually very readable, uh, especially if you uh, uh, look at the 1968 English translation, uh, which is available online. Um, and he explained all the uh, strange behavior that would be expected in theory if such materials did exist. But of course, they didn't exist. So that paper essentially got zero attention. However, one of the predicted, so the, the, the essence of the, uh, the uh, oddity of the behavior uh, lies in the following fact, that if you could have a material with epsilon mu both negative, essentially, even though energy is transported by waves, energy will go one way and waves will travel the opposite way. So again, epsilon mu both positive, K is the direction of the waves, theta S pointing to vector is the direction of the energy. They both travel in the same direction. Instead with negative so-called left-handed materials, uh, the wave travel in one direction and the energy travels in the opposite direction. And this has consequences and repercussions. But fine, so again, uh, energy goes one way with the group velocity and uh, the waves travel the opposite way with the wave velocity, also known as phase velocity. And so using this depiction, so the rays trace the uh, motion, the direction of energy. So when a wave transition between a positive, uh, a, a right-handed material, epsilon mu both positive, and a left-handed one with, with epsilon mu both negative. So normally the, uh, the energy keeps going, of course, after refraction, Whereas the direction of the waves uh, is inverted. So it, this is the positive medium. This is the uh, left-handed medium. So after refraction, the direction of the waves is reversed. Even though the energy keeps going, it has to because of energy conservation. And so if you really would like to reproduce these uh, interesting effects, what can you do? Well, this is what nature has on offer. That's it, nothing else. So those material properties uh, depend on the, atom the underlying atomic properties. So we only have so much leeway. So what can we do? What can we do? The only option is, since the atoms that nature so generously provides are not good enough, we can make our own. How about that? So the idea is to uh, build uh, a structure uh, by putting together, like Lego bricks, essentially, uh, artificial atoms, which are named meta atoms, that are essentially man made structures, artificial structures. And so, if you put them together, just like you know, a bunch of Lego bricks, and with them you form uh, uh, a microscopic specimen, then you can endow them in principle with any kind of uh, properties. And so, you can simulate, you can actually uh, uh, bring about any kind of electric and magnetic response in principle that you want. However, under what conditions is this possible? So this is, for example, the, sorry, the schematic picture of the crystal of sodium chloride, kitchen salt. And so you have this kind of uh, arrangement of the uh, cell structure. And so notice that, again, uh, these two numbers, mu and epsilon, how do they keep track 
on the complexities of a macroscopic atomic arrangement. Well, the issue is this. When waves hit upon an obstacle, they are diffracted by the obstacle. So they are bent by the obstacle and therefore generate all kinds of interesting patterns. Does the animation show? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, like this one, for example, this is one of my many vacation homes that I can afford because I work in Catholic University. <laughs> so notice how these beautiful, uh, pretty much straight line waves are bent upon hitting an obstacle. Okay, beautiful. Yeah? So, but the issue is that this happens provided that the size of the obstacle is comparable to the wavelength of the wave in question. And matter of fact, this fact, this fact that waves are diffracted by obstacles whose uh, dimensions are comparable to the wavelength is used to actually uh, determine the uh, microscopic structure of a crystal. Uh, so essentially, you have a specimen here whose crystal structure you don't know. So you send through the, through the system, through the specimen, uh, a beam of X-rays. Why X-rays? Because the wavelength of X-rays is comparable to the atomic spacing, which is of the uh, two angstrom. And so the waves are diffracted. They form a kind of patterns that are collected on a uh, on a screen. And so you see things like this. And so there are people who make a living by basically using this. Is again, this is the diffraction pattern of sodium chloride. Uh, so you would have no idea that this is kitchen salt. But again, there are people who make a living to uh, connect these diffraction patterns to the underlying crystal structure. And so they determine that that diffraction pattern must have been produced by this kind of structure. And in general, you can have diffraction patterns of all, with all degrees of complexities. Again, there are people who specialize in connecting the diffraction patterns to the crystal structure that produced them. So in order for a wave to be insensitive to all these crazy details, the condition is that the wave must have a wavelength much larger than the size of the obstacles. So the wave will completely ignore the obstacles. If somebody's standing right outside, right, you can see them, but you can hear them if they speak loud. What is the difference? Well, the difference is that visible waves are tiny with respect to the size of the door. So they are now diffracted by the door. They go straight. So the light waves cannot reach your eyes. But instead, the sound waves have wavelengths comparable to the size of the door. And so they are bent. And so that's how they reach you. Cool. So if we want to make these artificial materials, these meta materials, meta in Greek means beyond. I studied Greek for five years. So um, you have to make. Uh, these uh, unit cells much smaller than the wavelength of the uh, 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 radiation that you want to uh, manifest. This is the condition. And so under these conditions, even though you actually are making a structure with all kinds of details, all of these details are invisible to the wave, provided that the condition I just mentioned applies, so that you can attach to it a they are numbers, mu and epsilon, and the way will never know the difference. We'll never know that that material was not made by God, but was made by one of you. How about that? <clears throat> cool. And so now that we know the trick, this is what we have. So our possibilities have been expanded by having left-handed materials of both epsilon and mu being negative, and with all the wonderful consequences that we will see in a minute. Super -duper. And so, as I said, the basis of it is that energy flows one way and the waves travel the other way. And so, uh, here's the kind of behavior that we can expect. So, in normal materials, as I said, energy goes this way, the waves travel the same way. Uh, we have said many times that in negative index material, uh, negative refractive in index of refraction material, Instead, the opposite happens. Energy one way, the waves the opposite way. What about uh, uh, negative epsilon or negative mu materials? Well, in that case, the waves, if only one of the two parameters is negative, the waves cannot propagate. Instead, the, uh, the waveform the, uh, the, uh, basically decays exponentially with distance. So these are called evanescent waves. Uh, evanescent means vanishing. 
I'll, I'll just read what they're told that way. But these are the Hessian waves are not to be dismissed uh, because actually they carry uh, information about the most minute details of the source. Okay. We will see how we're going to exploit that. So this is another, uh, uh, again, diagram with a little more information. You can read it by yourself. This is going to be posted somewhere. It's going to be right here. So, you know, I don't read up my slides. You can see that for yourself. Uh, same story, forward propagation, both positive, backward propagation, both negative, no propagation in the other two cases, <clears throat> just exponential decay. Now, can this work only with electromagnetic waves? No. Who's to say that? It works with all kinds of waves such that uh, their uh, equations uh, resemble those of electromagnetic waves. Now, acoustic waves and electromagnetic waves physically are very different. However, uh, let's say under a linear approximation, which is good for most purposes, the uh, differential equation that describes the propagation of acoustic wave is identical in form to the uh, wave equation for electromagnetic waves, except that the role of mu and epsilon is replaced by these other two parameters, rho and d. Rho is the mass density, mass per unit volume, pretty straightforward. D is what is called the bulk modulus. It's a measure of how stiff the medium is. In other words, air. Air has a certain stiffness. So if you try to compress it, uh, with, uh, the you know, air in this case will try to resist that. How much? Well, that's measured by V, the bulk modulus. Again, is a measure of the stiffness of a medium. Water is stiffer than air, of course. And there are all kinds of different values for different media. So uh, again, mass density is force divided by acceleration. You can say, oh, nothing special. Force per unit volume divided by acceleration of the little uh, chunk of media. And instead, the bulk modulus essentially uh, is a relationship between the uh, delta P is the change with respect to, uh, to uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. And delta V over V is the fractional change in volume. Notice that there is a negative sign. This simply means, simply means that if the change in pressure is positive, then the change in volume is negative. If you push on something, that something tends to be sweet. That's all that. Okay, so uh, just by using the analogy, you can actually determine that uh, uh, actually rho plays the role of mu is the counterpart, is the acoustic counterpart to mu. And one over B, the reciprocal, also known as the compressibility, plays the role of epsilon. So the equations are identical. Richard Feynman used to say identical equations have identical solutions. So uh, that tells us that all the wonderful effects that we could get with electromagnetic waves could be uh, obtained with acoustic waves. And acoustic waves are a lot easier to work with than electromagnetic waves in this context, simply because their wavelengths are much larger in general. Circuit with visible uh, light. So same story. Uh, but at this point, I would expect all right, so nobody has actually winked or raised an eyebrow when I mentioned the possibilities of negative epsilon and mu. Okay, whatever, you know, if you can admit them, that's up. But what about having negative rho and negative d? What does that mean? Negative rho means a negative mass. So does it mean that if you have this metamaterial with negative rho, you drop it and it accelerates upwards instead of downwards? Uh, does it mean that? Is that possible? What about negative B? So does it mean that if you try to squeeze something, if you push on something, that something will actually expand? It's possible in some sense. So thanks for coming. This is uh, obviously in the terms. Uh, or does it? Yes. So the issue is that you have to stop thinking in static terms. So of course, if you exert a force on a mass in that direction, 
the mass works are not in the same direction, not in the opposite direction. When you think of static forces, but in reality, all these quantities can be sinusoidal functions of time, right? So in that case, rho can simply be considered as something that relates a force to an acceleration. Both functions of time, sinusoidal oscillating functions of time. Same story, B is something that relates an input to an output. The input, again, is the change in pressure, and the output is the fractional change in volume. So what would it mean to have those two values being negative? What does all that mean? Think of a simple uh, case of uh, pushing a child in a swing. In that case, the input would be the periodic pushes of course, you know, the analogy is not perfect because the pushes are not really sinusoidal and more like pulses, but periodic, nevertheless, more or less. And the, uh, the uh, output will be essentially the uh, kinetic energy of the child on the swing. Now, uh, when the input and output uh, both reach maximum and minimum at the same time, so they are as they say in electrical engineering, in phase, when the two weights are in phase, that means, of course, that the function that relates input with output is positive. So if one is five, the other one is seven. And again, the, when one is maximum, the other one is also maximum. That's when the function that relates the two is positive. Easy. Now, in general, if there is a phase delay, an angle delay, uh, in that case, the function that relates the two is complex. So it has not only an amplitude, but also a phase angle. So the amplitude simply rescales the signal, the input, and the phase angle of the complex number simply pushes the phase forward or backward, depending on whether it's positive or negative. That's all that means. So in this case is when the transfer function is complex. When the transfer function is purely imaginary, that means that the phase angle is 90 degrees, and so that means that the output is pushed forward or backwards by 90 degrees with respect to the input. It's as simple as that. Hi, but what about when the two input and output are in anti phase, uh, out of phase by 180 degrees, not a cycle? Well, obviously, when this is positive, this is negative. So having these functions, rho and b, negative simply means that uh, you have the input, the force that is oscillating, and within certain frequency ranges, the force is oscillating so fast that essentially the mass cannot keep up. So it develops a delay. So again, it's not that it accelerates backwards, it's trying to keep up with the force, simply can't. And so there is a 100 degree uh, phase delay between the two, nothing unphysical is observed all the time. So that's all that means to have a negative mass density. You have to stop thinking of a mass in static terms, but you have to think in dynamic terms. It's a transfer function between a force and an acceleration. All right? Have I convinced you that there's nothing blasphemous about negative masses and negative both moduli? That's all. It's about a delay in time. That's all there is. Now, this is the situation, okay? So when those parameters are positive, simply means that input and output are in phase. When they're negative, means that they are in anti-phase. And so, again, there's nothing scandalous about any of this. A rho is simply a transfer function, something that relates the input, the force, to the output, the acceleration, both sinusoidal functions of time. And likewise, the bulk modulus relates the input very the uh, variation in pressure with respect to atmospheric pressure to the fractional change in volume of the uh, volume packet of air that is being compressed. And so again, you can have all the same wonderful effects in terms of propagating waves, energy opposite the direction of travel of the wave or evanescent waves, exponentially decaying waves. Uh, this is another uh, uh, slide without the equations in case you rather than see the equations. Okay, so uh, for now, let's think in terms of electromagnetic waves. And so it turns out that, so you can read all the math here. 
this is a mathematical justification of what I just said, the reason why the, you know, energy travels opposite the direction of travel of the waves. Essentially, epsilon mu, both negative force in neutral refraction to be negative for reasons that you know, I'm telling you. So put my negative of force next time, and I will tell you all about it. Um, but when the index of refraction is negative, uh, again, it means because k uh, is proportional to the index of refraction, means that k, which is in the direction of propagation of the waves, when it uh, goes negative, whereas the direction, the, the sign of s, which is the direction of propagation of the energy, stays positive. Uh, and so let's see visually what that implies. What are the amazing phenomena that we can generate? Uh, so normally, uh, this is refraction between two media. So this is the incident ray. This is the normal to the surface, to the interface. And normally, the ray is refracted according to Schnell's law. But invariably, it is refracted on the opposite side of the normal with, with, uh, uh, with respect to the incident ray, always, because uh, it, it's just Schnell's law. However, if the, uh, and by the way, if both media both have in, uh, negative indices, it's the same story. But when one is positive and one is negative, instead, what happens is that the refraction happens on the same side of the norm. And so if you have to actually picture what this will look like, again, uh, case one, this is, so both of these media have positive indices. So there is refraction, and again, the direction of travel of the wave and the energy is the same. But case two, this is a negative medium now. So the refraction happens within the same side uh, of the normal. And as the energy continues to propagate, it has to, because energy cannot be created or destroyed, of course. But the direction of travel of waves instead is reversed. And so visually, what this will look like. So this is what happens with normal media. You, you know, you've seen this many times. You put a pencil in a chocolate of water. And so it looks bent. This is the refraction. Uh, this is what it would look like if there was some negative media, negative uh, refraction, uh, negative refracted index to watch. This is what it would look like. And this is a rendition of what it would look like. So this is normal water. This is negative index of refraction water. This is what you would see. At this point, you'd be thinking, okay, this is cute, but so what? So, uh, if we can make a slab of metal material with epsilon mu both negative, we could witness the phenomenon of superlinearity. What does that mean? So, essentially, because of the negative refraction, uh, you would have two. So, this is an object. Uh, point object. And so what, uh, what would happen is that the rays would be focused twice, once inside the object and once outside the object. Uh, but there's much more than that because, so normally this is what you will see, right? So this would be the object and this would be the image on the other side. But it's much more interesting than that because have you ever asked yourself a question? Uh, do you, do you see me? Can you see me? Okay. Now, uh, if you were to mount the way, could you see me? You probably can't see me, but could you see, for example, whether I have two eyes or three, or whether you know I have hair or have I lost it? Could you see that from two miles away? Well, why? It's such a dumb question, but it's the question that a five-year-old child would ask. And if you call her, it's obvious. It's like, yeah, that, why, why? So you've got to slap them out of time because you don't know what to tell them. Why? So the reason is that information about the details of the object are carried by wavelengths of the same size as those details. Those wavelengths are very small. Small wavelengths correspond to large values of k, the propagation vector. And those propagation vectors uh, correspond to evanescent waves. So those waves that carry precious information about the details of an object have long died out before you can reach it if you're too far away. 
So one of these ways is we could somehow retrieve that precious information. Well, this is what super lensing is about because check this out. This is nothing short of amazing to me. Uh, so in the white, you see the positive index media and uh, in the what is it? yellowish, uh, pale yellow, uh, this is a hypothetical negative index medium. So again, this is the object. So the wave, this is an evanescent wave, which is decaying. And this is what would happen if this was a regular medium. So it would keep decaying. So nothing would ever reach the other side. However, if you have a negative index medium with both epsilon and mu equal to negative one, magically the wave would actually be amplified within the, uh, the slab. Not only will be amplified, but it will be focused at a point such that the wave appears on the other side as if it had never propagated. So one way this is described is by saying the negative index media essentially uh, re, um, work as though the wave was propagating back in time. So the reason why waves uh, lose information along the way, so waves are like us. So as we travel in our journey through life, we get wind. Look at it. However, uh, it would be nice if we could somehow travel back in time. So every time to our, what is the useful thing? Right? But, uh, some of us are not in there. So it would be nice if we could travel back in time and recover. Oh, I look at this. Well, if you're a wave, negative index material, do it. So they can actually uh, have you travel back in time so that it appears at the other end when you are focused at the uh, image point as if you had never gone anywhere. So you appear at the image point exactly what you were like the minute you left the object. How about that? So what this uh, slab of metamaterial, this is what it does to propagating waves. They just focus them on the other side. And this is what it does to evanescent waves. It amplifies them. You can show it mathematically. So take my course whenever I offer it. Uh, and it shows you that at the, uh, the image point, the, it looks like as if the propagation has been completely reversed. So as if the wave has never left the object. So this is supposed to be is denoted with a perfect lens. This was for the first time proposed in 2000 by the great uh, uh, John Pendry, who the title of this one of the most widely cited articles on physical review letters is called Negative Refraction Makes a Perfect Lens in this case. So no information is lost. So to recap, so uh, this is how a normal lens works. So it simply focuses by forcing them, forcing uh, different rays to undergo different path lengths so that at the end of the journey, they all travel, they all focus at the same point by having traveled the same optical distance. Whereas at an essence wave, they're just killed. Instead, this is what happens with negative index materials. So he's able to focus not only uh, propagating waves, but also evanescent. So no information about the object in principle is lost. Uh, and so this is a wonderful depiction to indicate that, so this is supposed to be like the yin and yang. So these are positive media, these are negative media. So negative media are essentially uh, media that reverse the passage of time for waves. Uh, is this science fiction? Is just a math? No, this has been demonstrated. Uh, so the issue is this, that uh, there is a limit within which you can actually focus uh, electromagnetic energy. This is called the refraction limit and uh, is considered a fundamental limit. Uh, so this is the input. So this is what you would like, the, the region within which you would like to focus. So simply this is the object. This is the region within which you would like to focus the image. Again, this is impossible because of the diffraction limit. So it's being demonstrated using uh, this kind of setup that actually you can beat the diffraction limit. You can actually focus light 
more closely than the diffraction limit would allow you to do. And so one application, for example, is on photolithography. So photolithography essentially is a technique to, to carve uh, you know, structures within a specimen using light instead of using, for example, a chisel. And, and of course, you know, especially in the field of nanotechnology, uh, the smaller structures you can carve within one of these uh, specimens, these substrates, it depends on how, you know, how fine your chisel is. Well, with this technique, you can make chisels that are finer. And so that means you can actually carve structures that are small. Again, you're focused on light, and with that, that's, that's the tip of your chisel. And so ideally, you can make small structures. But this is probably the effect that is most widely publicized. This effect is called cloning. We always reference the popular culture. I don't know if you're a fan of Harry Potter, uh, but even if you're not, I'm sure you've heard of it. So the invisibility book and stuff. So what is the idea? Uh, this is a source of light. Now, if you're here and there is an object in the way, you can see the source because the object is what? In the way. So rays diverging from the source normally would just hit the object, not be able to penetrate and reach your house. 10 minutes? It's 20 minutes. 10 minutes. We say, oh, I have, yeah, okay, fine. No problem, no problem. And so, uh, wonderful. But if you could, some, so this is the object, right? So if you could somehow uh, enclose the object within such a negative index medium, then you can force the rays to be bent the other way, so they will travel to the other side as if the object was not there. And so you on the other side, instead of seeing the object, you will see the source. So this is a way of concealing an object from view. Is this science fiction? Well, it has been demonstrated with uh, microwaves, not yet with visible light, because again, the wavelength of visible light is too short. Uh, and so this is an example of an invisibility cloak. You can imagine that the military is very interested in this kind of thing because, again, you want to conceal an object, uh, like a vehicle, for example, not so much from eyesight, from view, but from radar waves. And those are wave, they have wavelengths that are very compatible with this kind of strategy. Uh, okay, so since we have five minutes, uh, let me jump through this. Uh, so the same effects can be obtained with acoustic waves going from a, a positive index material, B and rho both being positive, to B and rho both being negative. Exactly the same effects. Everything goes straight through, straight through. Uh, so how do you make them? So I'm just going to show you pictures uh, of how you make them. So with electromagnetic material, you can simulate essentially uh, electromagnetic responses. So uh, you can simulate uh, uh, an electrical response with rods and a magnetic response with these structures called split ring resonators. Uh, so this was demonstrated. Again, you can mix the two. And if you do mix the two, uh, this appeared for the first time in 1999, only in theory. And this is what the actual structure looked like when it was built and demonstrated, and boy, did it work. It did work. It did precisely what was expected mathematically to do. And this is pretty amazing. This was demonstrated in 2003. Uh, as for the negative uh, acoustic metamaterials, so the negative mass can be obtained, for example, with these kinds of uh, artificial structures. So you add this sphere. Uh, attached to springs, but within each of them, invisible to the observer, there is another sphere. So again, imagine sinusoidal uh, driving forces. Uh, within a certain frequency, frequency range, you can actually obtain a negative response. The math is there. Uh, what about negative bulk modules? This could be obtained in a number of ways, either with these membranes or with these so-called uh, Helmholtz resonators, basically a chamber with a smaller chamber. The math is there, just take my word for it. So I would like to jump right to, these are some pictures of some actual metamaterials that have been built. These are acoustic metamaterials. And by the way, uh, because these structures are so complex, the technique of choice to make these is 
additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing. So I'm going to jump right to the end. Uh, this, this I want to tell you about this one. So this is another thing that is being uh, uh, dreamt up. So uh, imagine this is a piece of infrastructure that you want to protect from seismic waves. So if you can actually surround this piece of infrastructure with these kinds of uh, structures, which will be buried in the ground, the idea is that they could deflect incoming seismic waves. And so you can actually prevent the bleeding uh, from earthquakes. The, economy, the economics of it. Uh, so there are many studies. This is uh, a study by this uh, consulting firm. Uh, the uh, CAGR is simply the uh, uh, combined, the compound annual growth rate, which is an economic indicator, essentially. The bigger, the better. Uh, and this is the growth that is forecast uh, until 2027. Uh, this is a day healthy numbers. For those of you who have taken business courses, this is a day healthy number. Uh, this is in terms of different uh, areas of application between 2019 and 2027. So the growth is enormous, it's many folds. These are some of the uh, actual companies that are in business now. Kinator, by the way, is located, so their headquarters, their corporate headquarters are in McLean, down the street. Uh, uh, this engineer behind this structure looks Japanese, and the reason why he does is because he's Japanese. So he works for Nissan Corporation. This is actually a, 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 a sound deadening structure that is actually used by Nissan. So uh, is much lighter than typical sound deadening materials. So how are you? And this is a uh, again a sound uh, deadening structure that is being installed in front of a building to protect the occupant of the building from noise. This is just a demonstration, but it works. Uh, fastest growing market is Asia Pacific, but the largest market is of course us. And this is the projection for 2020 to I believe 2026. And finally, uh, well, finally, one more after this. Uh, so this is very interesting. Uh, so initially, when a new industry comes out, the market is very fragmented. It's like the PC market 25 years ago. Uh, after when the industry is fully mature, then the market is consolidated. Only a few big players remain. This is where we are now. So it's not quite an infant, not quite in its infancy, but it's still uh, in its early years. And then in terms of geographical areas, you can see this for yourself. This is where in the, the green is where most of the growth is for This is in the right. application. Right. Uh, this is again another projection with again different applications. And having said all this, we're done. This part of the Any questions? A couple questions for him before they take us up. Yeah. So you're <laughs> even if I can't hear you, you have to. You're speaking about the evanescent age is the reason why you can't see people over two miles. Like, you say the same with messages and modulars, but they don't red light, right? So what would you do with evanescent? Who's about the evanescent wave? So the evanescent waves, they have very large values of K, which means very small wavelengths. Those small wavelengths carry information about small details. So this is particularly relevant, for example, in microscopy, right? But if it was full monochromatic, like red light, I, I would still be able to see the no, 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 no. You have an electromagnetic field that is propagating that could be decomposed uh, with a yeah. Yeah. So, there, so, so they're always there, there. they're always there. So there's no such thing as a monochromatic wave. So uh, the, the, uh, everything that leaves an object contains everything. So it essentially is a field that carries information about the object. So it cannot be a sinusoidal wave that carries information about a complex object or any kind of object. It's never a monochromatic wave, never. So you know, in order to reconstruct information about an object, a monochromatic wave contains only one number. How can I describe the complexity of a, any physical object with one number? It's impossible. So anything that produces images, so an image is complicated, right? 
So it can never be produced by a single monoclonal effect. Isn't a single monoclonal effect carries only that number. Yeah. So the issue is that your the field is, the, the the wave is scattered. So once the wave is scattered, it has a complex spatial structure. So that forces the field to acquire other components, other layer components. So in the interest of time, there's Thanks, our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in the hallway, if you have any lingering yeah. questions. Right, but there will be. So, I uh, offer coursing the materials last spring, and the plan is to offer it again probably in the fall. Yeah, so, so take his course, it will be awesome. You're going to learn more about how to create invisible clothes. And I will be going as <laughs> class because nobody's going to pick us up. <laughs> thank you all. all right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, are you?